So today we've moved on from internal combustion engines and we'll start to talk about Brayton cycles. Now Brayton cycles are natural gas power plant cycles and we'll see that we also essentially use Brayton cycles for jet engines. So this is the same table we have for US utility scale electricity generation by source in 2019 and we see that natural gas power plants make up about 40% of US energy usage. So why does that matter to us? When we look at natural gas powered power plants, we see that from this table in the textbook that these are powered by Brayton cycles. So Brayton cycles are pretty important for us to be able to understand as mechanical engineers working in the United States or even across all of North America and the rest of the world. Because, at least in the U.S., they make up about 40% of the energy that we use in the country. So why do we like gas turbines? Why do we like these natural gas power plants? So they're typically faster and cheaper to make, especially when you compare them to nuclear power plants. There are large shale gas deposits in the U.S. so that moving to gas power plants not only represents lower prices, but also energy independence for the United States. They're used in power plants, but they're also used in vehicle propulsion. In a couple of lectures, we'll start to talk about turbojets and how they use Brayton cycles at the core of their power plant system. But there are still some cons to having gas-fired power plants. The first is that natural gas is still a fossil fuel, and while it may have lower emissions than coal, it's certainly not emission-free. There's also issues with extracting natural gas. So in the United States, there's certainly been some political discussion and some environmental discussion about how we best get natural gas out of the earth using the process called fracking. So there's still some open questions, and I'm sure that there are engineering improvements we can make to that process as well, although that goes beyond the scope of thermodynamics. So gas turbine power plants essentially look like this. You might think that this is only a three-component system. So what we do is we take air in from the environment and we compress it. Remember, compressors are like pumps, but the working fluid is an ideal gas. So the purpose of this compressor is to increase the pressure of the air. Then that air goes into the combustion chamber where it gets mixed with fuel and combusted. So that increases the temperature. And then we have this high pressure, high temperature natural gas air mixture that wants to expand through the turbine. And when it does that, it moves those turbine blades and causes this shaft to spin. Now what's pretty cool about these types of systems is that the turbine and the compressor are connected by the same mechanical shaft. So whereas in the Rankine cycle, the turbine was producing power, which was put on the grid, and then the pump is kind of plugged into the grid, so it's running. Here we have this physical mechanical connection, so that spinning the turbine also spins the compressor, which gets us to run our system. So these systems are sort of similar to Rankine cycles in that they're all open systems, but they're also sort of different because the working fluid is different. Now, remember our basic Rankine cycle had four components, and this, the way we actually run Brayton cycles, they only have three components. So what we do is we model this like a four component system where this other heat exchanger is added. But in real life, this other heat ex exchanger is essentially the environment because we're exhausting hot gas out and we're pulling cold gas in. So somewhere in the environment, this hot gas is cooling back off so that it can become an input to our Brayton cycle. So here's a bit of an animation of how the gas turbine power plant works. So this came from the textbook. So here we have air entering the compressor. So this blue dot comes into our compressor. So here we're adding power in and we're increasing the pressure and the temperature of that natural gas. Air then goes into the combustion chamber where it's mixed with fuel and we get this chemical process. This adds more heat to our working fluid. So it comes out as a high pressure, high temperature natural gas, which means that it's got lots of enthalpy. 
we get this high enthalpy fluid to run through the turbine and that generates power. Now what happens is there's always more air coming in. And like we said, the turbine and the compressor are connected by this shaft. So as the turbine spins, so does the compressor. The net work is the turbine power that's not consumed by the compressor that goes out to the grid. So where do we get heat in in this particular cycle? So here we take external combustion. So we have fuel that's running into our heat exchanger or our combustor. It gets mixed with the air and it gets ignited. So while this fuel is often natural gas, it could also be biomass or municipal solid waste. It could be waste heat from industrial processes. It could be solar thermal energy. It could be gas cooled nuclear reactor. So basically we can have a nuclear reactor and then instead of just pulling cooling water from something like say Lake Ontario, we can take gas, run it through, use that as the coolant and then use what we're using. So chain together sort of a nuclear power plant and now this gas power plant, put them together so that we're using some of the waste heat from that nuclear power plant to power a secondary power plant. So closed gas turbine power plants don't really exist because if we just had the air running through here, what would happen is every time we ran through the combustor, we would have less and less oxygen in our air until eventually that combustion process wouldn't be able to happen anymore. But it's still a useful way to model this type of system because we can figure out how much heat gets rejected if we assume that the exit to the turbine is actually plumbed in to the inlet of the compressor as we run through some sort of heat exchanger that rejects heat. If we do this, we can think of Brayton cycles as four component systems, just like we thought of a basic Rankine cycle. Here we have a compressor, which is adding power, sort of the equivalent of a pump, a heat exchanger where we're adding heat, an equivalent of a steam generator, but of course there's no steam here because our working fluid is an ideal gas. We have a turbine, the workhorse of the system, whose purpose is to create power. And then we have this heat exchanger, which is really the environment which we're using to reject heat. Again, the textbook likes these animations where the little circle runs around the cycle so that we can see that if we look at it like this, then it becomes a closed system. The heat rejected is transferred to the environment. In this case, we're assuming that's happening in an actual component, where in actuality, what happens is this exhaust gas goes out to the environment where it cools off, and then we're pulling in cool air from the environment. So if we use the Rankine cycle as kind of our base cycle, how do we compare the Rankine cycle with this Brayton cycle? Remember, there are three main questions that we want to ask when we're doing cycle analysis problems. The first is what's the energy benefit and the energy cost? So a Brayton cycle is a heat engine. So its energy benefit is net power and its energy cost is heat in. This is the same as a Rankine cycle. In the Rankine cycle, we chained together a series of open processes. We're going to do the same thing in the Brayton cycle. So this is different from something like an internal combustion engine where all of our processes happened in the same place over different periods of time. Here, just like in the Rankine cycle, we're going to say we're going to take instantaneous looks, rate equation analyses of these different components. And what happens is our mass is moving through different components as we complete the cycle. So this will again look more like a Rankine cycle than it will an internal combustion engine. Finally, we ask, what's the fluid? So this will help us once we get our symbolic solutions, where we have lots of things like delta H, how do we find those H's or the delta H's? In the Rankine cycle, the fluid was water, and we were bouncing back and forth across the vapor dome. That won't happen in a Brayton cycle, because here, the working fluid is an ideal gas. We can think of it as air, right? Because we're pulling in air from the environment. Air does not go back and forth across the vapor dome, unless you get to really, really cold temperatures. So what happens here is our fluid, the way we're going to find the enthalpies, is going to look a lot like it did for the internal combustion engines. 
right? So again, we see we have a choose your own adventure and we can think of the Brayton cycle as some combination of the Rankin cycle because it's a heat engine and it's an open system and an internal combustion engine because it's a heat engine, but the working fluid is an ideal gas. So we'll use some of the strategies that we learned when we were doing Rankin cycles and some of the strategies that we learned while we were doing internal combustion engines, right? But the big difference here between the Brayton cycle and the Rankin cycle is that the working fluid is an ideal gas. So what assumptions do we make when we're using an ideal gas? And do they differ from the assumptions we made when we were doing internal combustion engines? First, we're going to neglect combustion. Just like in the internal combustion engine, we're going to say the working fluid is only air. We're going to neglect that any kind of combustion or chemical reaction happens inside our combustor. We're just going to say we're adding heat there. We're not going to make the assumption we did for internal combustion engines where the systems are closed. In fact, we'll do a series of open system analyses using the open versions of the first law and the second law and conservation of mass may become important. We are also not going to assume that all the processes are reversible. Remember, this was part of our assumption or our chain of assumptions when we were doing internal combustion engines, but we don't need to do that for an air standard analysis of a Brayton cycle because we can use things like the isentropic efficiency of turbines and compressors now in order to find real exits. So we're not forced into assuming that these things are reversible. We're going to assume that our working fluid is air, which is an ideal gas. We're going to neglect the fact that this composition of this gas changes as we add fuel and then as we combust the fuel. We're also going to say that this is dry air, so there's no water vapor inside of it, no humidity. That's kind of a thermo 2 thing where you'd start to look at what we call psychrometrics, which is kind of an acknowledgement that in the air that's all around us, we have water vapor that's inside of that air. We'll also sometimes make the assumption that the specific heat is constant when we move to a cold air standard analysis. In fact, we'll do that in the example problem I'll go through today. So this is our Brayton cycle. We have four components, although one of them is imaginary in this heat exchanger, which is really just the environment but we have four states. It looks a little bit like our basic Rankine cycle. And honestly, there's an analogy for all of these components if they're not just there in the Rankine cycle too, right? So a turbine exists in both of our components. We had a condenser in the Rankine cycle, but here we just have this heat exchanger where we're rejecting heat. But the energy purpose of this component is the same. We have a compressor, which increases the pressure of our working fluid, just like our pump did in the Rankine cycle. And we have a combustor, which adds heat, just like our steam generator did in the Rankine cycle. So this is a lot like our four component Rankine cycle. But now when our working fluid is natural gas, we call this a Brayton cycle. A Brayton cycle is a heat engine. That means its energy benefit is net power and its energy cost is the heat transfer that we add into the system, often by burning natural gas. We can also characterize this system using its backwork ratio. Remember, the backwork ratio recognizes that the power plant is the first consumer of the power plant so that some of our turbine power goes to powering our compressor. We can look at this because the mass flow rates, at least in this four component system, are the same between the turbine and the compressor. We can divide both of these things through the mass by the mass flow rate through the system and get the specific power through the compressor divided by the specific power of the turbine. Now remember when we did Rankine cycles, I was saying the reason that we condense that fluid down is because it's much easier to increase the pressure of a subcooled liquid because it's incompressible. Now, unfortunately, when our working fluid is air, it takes a lot more power for that compressor to increase the pressure of the working fluid. So backwork ratios in Brayton cycles tend to be significantly higher than they are in Rankine cycles because we're trying to compress a compressible fluid. <clears throat> so how do we analyze each of the components in the system? 
Again, if you're not sure what to do in thermodynamics, using the first law is always a good idea. So I write down my first law, remembering that I've assumed that all of these processes are open processes. So I have to write down the open version of the first law. And because my mass is moving through my system, and I'm just looking instantaneously at how the system is performing, I use the rate version of this equation. I'll assume that the system is at steady state, that it's one inlet and one outlet, that the kinetic energy can be neglected, that the change in potential energy can also be neglected, that each component is either adiabatic or passive, unless I'm told otherwise, and I'll also, just like in the Rankine cycle, assume that frictional losses and heat losses between different components can be neglected. So if we can make all of those assumptions, we'll get these equations for our different components. Remember, we have the compressor and the turbine that are adiabatic. So here, we're trying to find power. Power, from the first law, if we make all those assumptions that we talked about, is going to be m dot times h in minus h out. The compressor is like a pump, so we're putting work in. Here, our power term will be negative. The turbine is producing power, so its power term should be positive. The combustor and the heat rejection phase, right, so where we're cooling this working fluid off, are going to be m dot times h out minus h in. In this case, we're adding heat in the, conduct in the combustor, so it's positive, and we're rejecting heat when we're rejecting heat, so here we have negative heat transfer rates. So after we do this, we get our symbolic solutions and we ask ourselves, what's the fluid? Now the difference, the big difference between the Brayton cycle and the Rankine cycle is that the working fluid here is an ideal gas. So we'll find H or delta H differently than we would for Rankine cycles. In fact, the ways that we'll try to find H and delta H will be much more similar to what we had for internal combustion engines. If I have to draw a PV diagram or a TS diagram of a Brayton cycle, this is what I'd have. At least this is what I'd have if my compression and my turbine processes were isentropic, right? So on the TS diagram, which I prefer to draw for these open systems, I start pulling air into my compressor. My compressor increases my pressure. Then I add heat, and as I'm adding heat, my temperature goes up. Then I have this high temperature, high enthalpy fluid that I run through my turbine to produce work. And then after the exit of my turbine, my working fluid has to cool down before it gets pulled back into the compressor. So here, my first process where I'm compressing my fluid is adding power. My second process in my combustor I'm adding heat. My third process, I'm producing power in my turbine. And my last process, I'm rejecting heat to the environment. So this is what a TS, or over here a PV diagram for a Brayton cycle looks like. Notice in the PV diagram that as we're adding heat and as we're rejecting heat, we're assuming that the pressure remains constant. That's going to be important for us as we start to move through a problem because oftentimes we won't be told, say, P3 or P4, but we'll remember that P2 is equal to P3 and that P1 is equal to P4. So we're assuming that there's no friction losses as we're adding and rejecting heat because if there were friction losses, we'd have a pressure drop across these components. We also assume, or at least we can assume, that the compression and turbine processes are isentropic, right? So in the ideal case, we'll have these processes be adiabatic, steady state, one inlet, one outlet, and ideal, so that entropy generation term will go to zero, and that will leave us with delta S is equal to zero if we're going through the ideal process. Remember, when we draw these PV and TS diagrams, particularly if we're talking about reversible processes, then the area inside of our cycle on a PV diagram is our net power, and the area 
inside our TS diagram is the net heat. Now these areas should be equal because the net power should be equal to the net heat if the processes are reversible. We know that the net power should be equal to the net heat. This is important because we can talk about different parameters when we're talking about a Brayton cycle. In particular, we will often talk about the ratio of the pressures at the end of the compression cycle divided by the beginning of the compression cycle. So this is called a compressor pressure ratio, which is not always easy for me to say, but it's kind of like the compression ratio in an internal combustion engine. And here we can see that if we increase our compressor pressure ratio, so then we go from P1 to P2 prime instead of P1 to P2, if everything else stays the same, if we have the same delta S across our system, then we now are going to move up to 3 prime when we add heat, and we've got a much larger area for our cycle. That larger area means more net power and more heat transfer. So if we increase our compressor pressure ratio, we get more net work, which means we get more net heat. We also see in this case that the thermal efficiency increases as compressor pressure ratio increases as well. The turbine inlet temperature here also increases. So this is part of the reason why we like to do this. Again, provided that we're going between the same specific entropies. So here, when we do this, we get a higher T hot. And we know from the Carnot efficiency equation that if we have a higher T hot, remember efficiency in a Carnot cycle is one minus T cold over T hot. So as T hot increases, then our ideal thermal efficiency, the maximum thermal efficiency we can get also increases. We know in practice that Tmax is limited by materials, so we don't want to melt the components in our system, but it's also limited by the fuel and the burning temperature or the combustion temperature of the fuel that we're using. So here we can look at two different Brayton cycles. They both have the same maximum temperature, but they have different compressor pressure ratios. So you see here, three prime and three happen at the same temperature. Remember, this might be limited by, say, the melting temperature of our turbine. So there's two ways that I can get to this maximum temperature. I can either have a very high compressor pressure ratio and then sort of a lower heat transfer phase, right? So here I'm adding heat for a smaller delta S and then I come back down. Or I can have a lower compressor pressure ratio and get to this maximum temperature over here right before coming down. So what's the difference between these two cycles? So they have the same maximum temperature, but they have different compressor pressure ratios. Cycle A, that's this cycle with the larger compression ratio, has a greater thermal efficiency. Cycle B has a larger enclosed area, so it has a better or higher power. There's a trade-off here. So oftentimes this happens in mechanical engineering and other forms of engineering too, where we can't maximize two things at the same time. So here, if we increase our net power, it often comes at the expense of thermal efficiency. Whereas if we're trying to maximize our thermal efficiency, it often comes at the expense of net power. So oftentimes we have to think as engineers, why are we going to use this particular cycle? So if you're talking about an aero application, so if you're using a Brayton cycle at the core of a turbojet engine, you may want to maximize your power to weight ratio because ultimately your airplane needs to be able to fly through the air. So here you might want to maximize power, but you also want to minimize weight. So you have to think about what your application is. If you're running a power plant, you might be maximizing or optimizing for efficiency. So here, size and weight is less constrained because you don't have to put this thing up in the air. So it may be desirable to maximize thermal efficiency, or at least your thermal efficiency might be more important here than it would be in an aero application where the primary thing you need to do in an airplane is fly. 
So we know that in these Brayton cycles, they're not always going to be ideal, right? They're not always going to be isentropic turbines and compressors. So how do we deal with these turbines and compressors? So we can fix the real states with isentropic efficiencies in the same way we did for Rankine cycles. So we need to define isentropic efficiencies. Remember that for a turbine, the isentropic efficiency is the real turbine power divided by the ideal turbine power. Remember, as we go through the turbine, we're generating power and that's a benefit. So the irreversibilities in the system reduce that benefit. So the ideal turbine produces more power than the real turbine. For a compressor, we're going to invert this ratio where our power through the ideal compressor is less than the power through the real compressor. Now, this compressor power is a cost. And the irreversibilities in the system make us pay a higher cost than the ideal system. So here, the real power is higher through a compressor than the ideal presser. So if we can make the assumptions that we usually make, our turbine efficiency will be H3 minus H4 divided by H3 minus H4S. That's the inlet minus the outlet on both the top and the bottom, but the bottom has the isentropic outlet. For the compressor efficiency, we'll again have H in minus H out on the top and the bottom, but we'll have the isentropic outlet on the top where we have our ideal compressor power. So now that we've introduced this Brayton cycle, let's go through and do an example. So here we're told that we have an isentropic turbine and compressor. So these are ideal on my TS diagram. I have a vertical compressor and a vertical turbine as I'm moving on my TS diagram. And I'm asked to find the net power per unit mass flowing through the system, or little w dot net, and I'm asked to find the thermal efficiency. In this case, I'm told the temperature and pressure at state 1, so that's good, I feel like I can fix that state. I'm only told the pressure at state 2. For state 3, I know the maximum temperature is 1700 degrees Kelvin, and I don't know anything about state 4. So how do I go about solving this problem? First, I want to find symbolic solutions. My net power per unit mass flowing through the system is going to be my turbine power plus my compressor power, both per unit mass flowing through the system. Again, I recognize that if I'm using the first law in the hip to wind sign convention, my compressor power will be negative. For both of these components, I'll assume that they're at steady state that they have one inlet and one outlet, that I can neglect kinetic and potential energy changes, and that they're adiabatic. And if I do this, I get that the power through both of these components is going to be H in minus H out after I divide by the mass flow rate. So in this case, my net power per unit mass flowing through the system is H3 minus H4 plus H1 minus H2. So now I have a symbolic solution for the net power. If I'm going to assume that the specific heat is constant, then these delta H's become CP times delta T. And since the specific heat is going to be the same for both of these processes, because I'm assuming that there's no change in the working fluid, then I get CP times all of T3 minus T4 plus T1 minus T2. I don't know T4, I do know CP, I don't know T2, I do know T3, and I do know T1. So I could find the net power per unit mass flowing through the system if I knew T2 and T4. So eventually, I'll go through and fix my states, but for now, I want to get symbolic solutions to all of these parts. The next part of the problem asks me what's the thermal efficiency. Now, thermal efficiency is net power divided by heat in, or net power per unit mass flowing through the system, divided by heat in per unit mass flowing through the system. And I already have the net power per unit mass flowing through the system. Well, I don't have the number, but I have the equation. So I know the numerator, 
But now I do a first law analysis on the combustor so that I can get the denominator. In this case, it's steady state, one inlet, one outlet. I can neglect kinetic and potential energy changes and the component is passive, meaning that there's no power going on inside the control volume. Now I have an equation for thermal efficiency that's only a function of enthalpies. But I want to assume that the specific heat here is constant. So I pull out specific heat from the numerator and the denominator. I see that it's a factor of both. So I actually don't need CP to find the thermal efficiency. And instead, I know that this is going to be T3 minus T4 plus T1 minus T2. In the denominator, I have T3 minus T2. I don't know T4. I don't know T2. I don't know, I do know T3, I do know T1, and again, I know T3 in the denominator. So here, if I knew T2 and T4, then I would be able to solve this problem. So now I'm at the point where I have to go through and fix my states. So again, I've said this before, but it's important to remember that when we're dealing with cycles, where the working fluid is air or some other ideal gas, it's really important that we identify which processes are isentropic. Now in this case, the isentropic states are not labeled with an S, but I know that my compression, as I go from state one to state two and I move through the compressor, I'm assuming this is an isentropic process. I'm also assuming that it's isentropic as I move through my turbine, which is from state three to state four S. So those are my two isentropic processes. When I have an isentropic process that's an ideal gas and I'm assuming constant specific heat, what I do is I look for an equation that has K in the exponent. These are the isentropic relationships for ideal gases with constant specific heats. Here, I find that T2S divided by T1 is going to be equal to P2 over P1 all to the power of K minus one over K. Now, P2 over P1 is my compressor pressure ratio, right? I get that in this case because it's 800 divided by 100, or my compressor pressure ratio, which is not easy to say, is equal to eight. K for air is always approximately 1.4. So now I have T2 over T1 is equal to eight, all to the power of 0.4 divided by 1.4. I can use this equation to find that T2 is 543 degrees Kelvin. So I put that up in my state table. Now I'm going to move from T state two to state three. This is not an isentropic process because here I'm adding heat, so it's not adiabatic. But I already know the temperature, right? Because the problem told me, sometimes this is not explicitly stated on the, uh, on the state table. But often, the problem will tell me something like the maximum temperature in the cycle is 1700 degrees. So here, I know that the maximum temperature happens after heat addition. The other thing I know about the heat addition process is that as I move from state two to state three, I'm assuming that there's no friction losses, no pressure losses in the component. So here, I know that P2 is equal to P3, which in this case is 800 kilopascals. So I've already fixed state three. Now, as I move from state three to state four, I know that this process is isentropic again. So I need to use, again, my relationship for isentropic processes. But before I do that, I have to find out what the pressure at state four is. So there's two ways that I can do this. So one, I can use my compressor pressure ratio and realize that's the same ratio of pressures as I have across the compressor, across the turbine. But now across the turbine, I'm reducing pressure. So I can take this 800 kilopascals and divide by eight and get 100 kilopascals. I can also remember that this heat rejection process from state four to state one also happens at constant pressure. So my outlet pressure, so this is a jet exiting into the environment. So that should be the same pressure as the environment. 
and a jet entering from the environment should also have the same pressure as the environment. So these two pressures have to be the same. Now, I know the pressure as I move from state three to state four, which is good because when I use my isentropic relationship with K in the exponent, I'm going to need my pressure ratio. Notice that this is a little bit different than what we did for internal combustion engines because internal combustion engines where the process was closed, we typically knew the volume ratio or we could find the volume ratio. And in open systems, like compressors and turbines, we'll typically know the pressure ratio, right? So in this case, we know the pressure ratio. It's one over R. Again, we know that K minus one over K is 0.4 divided by 1.4. And we find that T4S is 938.5. Now this problem could have been more complicated if we had isentropic efficiencies. So if we had isentropic efficiencies, we would have done the same thing here. It's just we would have first found 2s in the same way that we did, and then we would have used the isentropic efficiency of the compressor to find the real outlet. And we could have done the same thing at the turbine, first finding the isentropic outlet in the same way that we've done here, and then using isentropic efficiency to find the real outlet. Or I could have given you what the real outlet from one or two of those components was and asked you to tell me what the isentropic efficiency was. So these are the kind of things that we might ask you on a test so that you can demonstrate your understanding of the material. Now we have our symbolic solutions for both the net power per unit mass flowing through the system and for the isentropic efficiency. And at this point, because we're assuming a cold air standard or a constant specific heat, these things are only a function of temperature. And because I know all the temperatures, I can find both of these things, that the net power per unit mass flowing through the system is 520.7 kilojoules per kilogram, and that the thermal efficiency is 44.8%. Now that's pretty good. I think uh, if you remember when we were using our Rankin cycles, our four component Rankin cycle problem that we did, I think maybe had a thermal efficiency in the 20s, maybe something like 25, 28%, something like that. Um, and here it's 44.8%. So even though the back work ratios of these natural gas power plants tend to be high, they also tend to have fairly high thermal efficiencies. But if we compared this thermal efficiency to the Carnot efficiency, we'd still be underperforming the ideal case, right? We're always underperforming the ideal case, but as engineers, sometimes we want to ask the question, how do we improve thermal efficiency? We know that this has financial benefits and environmental benefits, so it's a win-win if we can figure out how to do this. In next class, we'll look at how we can improve thermal efficiency of Brayton cycles. Thanks for joining me on Thermodynamics. I'll see you again next.